All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining our session for this afternoon. Um, both uh, Jan, Janet and I are very excited to be able to present on this topic. I think it's a very important one. And so we'll just dive right in. Um, both of us will introduce ourselves um, since we'll be co-facilitating. Um, so I am the Environmental Justice Program Manager with Black Women for Wellness, and I'll share a little bit more about our organization. And Janet is the Director of Campaign for Safe Cosmetics Medics, Director of Program and Policy with Breast Cancer Prevention Partners. So on behalf of myself and my colleague, Janet Noodleman, we would like to thank you for inviting us to speak today on the injustice of Black women's beauty and how you can be an advocate for change. Um, while we'll be talking about the injustice of Black women's beauty vis-a-vis -vis on this topic of uh, toxic chemicals and the toxic products marketed to Black women and their impact of the health and well-being of Black women and girls. Janet will then follow with a presentation on how this can be readily available in terms of um, regulation, right? So how is this even possible? So the lack of cosmetic safety regulation and how you can get involved to change the face of the toxic beauty industry. And as I mentioned at the end, we'll leave some time, hopefully for at least about 10 minutes for Q&A. So just an overview of our presentation uh, for the time we have together, we'll be outlining the problem statement, talking about the demographics related to Black women and beauty, and some of the links between um, Black beauty products and negative impacts that they can have on our health. Also, why is this a concern? So we'll be addressing this, uh, the lack of government regulation, as uh, duly noted, and then what you can do to solve this problem. So looking at the safer uh, beauty bills that are on the table right now for federal regulation, as well as what you can do on a personal and a political level. So just briefly to um, let you know a little bit more about myself and our organization, Black Women for Wellness. Uh, we've been around for about 24 years now. We were founded in 1997, if you can believe that. And so our main mission is to um, uplift and educate Black women and girls. And we do this uh, through our commitment to health and well-being for Black women and girls through health education, empowerment and advocacy. As the manager for the environmental justice program, we look at a variety of things. If you think about it, um, every day you're interfaced with something, whether it's from waking up to the water you're able to drink, um, having access to clean air, um, also in personal you know, care products in terms of beauty aid, hair care, um, and personal hygiene. So all of these are addressed through what we do at Black Women for Wellness in terms of looking at communities of color and how we can eliminate um, systemic racism and bring about change for um, better regulation. So quickly here, if you all can pull out your smartphones, um, our devices and be able to scan, we'll trust it out. You guys will let us know whether this works or not. Um, so the question here is, do you think the Federal Drug Administration regulates cosmetic safety the same way it regulates the safety of food and drugs? And so that should be able to take you to another screen where you can be able to answer that question. And so um, if you look, I'm able to see your responses. So it says about 100% huh? all <laughs> you say no. So um, you guys are on it. Yes, they do not have the same uh, regulation safeties for how they do with um, food and drugs, medical devices, if you will. And so we have a lot of work to do in terms of better regulation for the um, beauty industry. So next slide, please. So here we would um, want to talk a little bit about how those products are marketed to women of color, color excuse me. So beauty products are marketed um, to us. Um, they can contain some of the most harmful ingredients, if you can imagine, um, that are used and from um, makeup, <laughs> uh, hair care products. Clearly, this is of concern. And so why is this a problem? Because it can affect our um, health and well-being overall. And so if we're thinking about relaxers, hair dyes, 
eyes, all of those things alike in terms of lipsticks, you know, um, having formaldehyde, if you can imagine what that, you know, I'm sure, you know, um, embalming fluids and, you know, putting that onto, you know, our bodies. And so clearly this is a problem that is faced largely um, by Black women and girls um, across the board for all races. But uh, we would like to bring note that um, Black women are, you know, carry a higher toxic load. And so Black people make up about 13% of the U.S. population, but Black women purchase more beauty products per capita than any other demographic, suggesting that uh, we are overexposed and potentially um, can have harm to more ingredients in our bodies as it relates to cosmetic products that we use daily. In fact, Black women spend more than $7.5 billion on beauty products, beauty aids every year. So I know if you're anything like me, a beauty junkie, you're contributing to this uh, vast industry. And so uh, with that duly noted, we need to know how we can clean up this industry. Just because it's on a self shelf does not mean that it is safe for you. And so we just want to you know, make sure that we bring awareness to, uh, and attention to this matter. Next slide. And so Black women in America, why is this uh, particularly important? So I mentioned that we carry a higher toxic load in terms of, you know, chronic diseases. Um, breast cancer, as we, you know, rounding out the, um, the year, you know, we, we just had breast health awareness last month in October. So rightfully, you know, so we need to look at, you know, what are some of the chronic diseases that are faced, you know, particularly among Black women. Um, and breast cancer um, is one of those chronic diseases. So one particularly devastating disease that we hear, you know, a lot about um, is Black women and breast cancer. So although Black women don't have the highest rates of uh, getting breast cancer, we do have the largest, you know, percentages of dying from it. And this, as you can see here noted um, in the second to last bullet point, is because we uh, get the most aggressive forms. So this is um, in particular of concern. It's the triple negative breast cancers, um, the risks that we face in this um, in relation to this. So Black women have at least about a 31% of breast cancer mortality rate and 41% uh, higher than white women, white or Caucasian women. And young Black women under 45 have a higher rate of breast cancer than Caucasian women, as well as Black women have a higher rates of the triple negative breast cancer, which is the most aggressive form, as I noted. And so what are some of the potential links to, you know, these chronic diseases and the adverse effects, as you can see here, it's a long list. And so um, if we look at in terms of relaxers, hair straighteners, hair dyes, there's science or research that supports, you know, the link to, you know, some of these chronic diseases. Um, you can see on the um, second column here. So if we look at the beauty aids on the left hand column and then some of the related um, conditions um, in regards to, you know, um, uterine fibroids, uh, endometrius, uh, breast cancer, as we just noted, urinary dysfunction, infertility um, is also, you know, something that's becoming more prevalent within, you know, the Black communities as well. And so we want to make sure that we're aware of this. And so, you know, having these, you know, discussions, talking to your healthcare provider. Um, so if there's anything of concern that you may, you know, notice that is, you know, out of the norm, um, um, where you may, you know, um, have, you know, certain order or smell and you go to your healthcare provider to be, you know, able to be treated to that, to be able to, you know, have a discussion, um, but also knowing what you can do on your own. And so we don't necessarily recommend <clears throat> Um, personal care, personal hygiene care products, such as like douches, I'm sure you all know this, feminine sprays and wipes, because this can disrupt your, you know, reproductive system. And so taking, you know, consideration of the products that you use. Next slide. Um, with Black Women for Wellness, I want to make um, note that we have a, a great uh, study that we're, you know, putting in, um, into place with Occidental College um, here in Southern California, as well as with the data that's supported by Silent Spring Institute. And what we found from this study, just to let you know, um, we looked at 70 women. So it was a cohort of 35 Black women, Black identified women, and 35 Latina X women. Um, and over the course of seven days, um, we created an app where they would log in their beauty, well, not even beauty products, they were logging all of their products um, from morning up to, you know, um, to the end of evening. So you name 
name it, um, mouthwash, you know, toothpaste, uh, um, body, you know, care, um, deodorants, um, just washing your hand from your day to day, you know, um, any cleaning products and things of that nature. And so at the end of the seven weeks, we took the uh, biomarker, which is urine samples, and we were able to send that off to a lab to see what products came up and what were some of the highest used products among the participants in the studies. And so what we learned from this is that women in the study reported to you on average to use about eight products uh, throughout the day. And I know uh, prior to this uh, um, discussion and planning, Janet and I had the discussion and she asked, you know, um, just as a curiosity, how many products, you know, does one use? And particularly me, you know, asked that question. And I said, hmm, just, you know, throwing out a figure of about six and I'll share on the next slide. You will be amazed about, you know, number of products that we use to interface throughout the day. And so on the lower side, uh, eight products is really good. And so with, um, some of them using up to 30 products, which is, you know, rightfully so if you, you, you know, add in sunscreen, nail polish, you know, you name it. And so uh, for 28 of the 54 products that we saw throughout the, you know, study, they vary significantly by race and ethnicity. So again, as we mentioned, we um, interface with both Black and Latino women. Uh, Latino um, or Black women tend to use more hair care products. <laughs> so yes, um, we know natural hair definitely does take a lot of work. And the Latin um, X um, women, they tend to use more of the beauty products. And so um, wanting to make note of the products that we use. And so here, 70% of women prefer scented versions of the products that they use. And so another thing that um, Janet will be talking about in terms of regulation is synthetic fragrance. And so I'll leave that for her, why that's so important to bring notice of the products that you use in the fragrance um, um, that is contained in them. So um, we're still working with this study. Um, we just did a round of focus groups to be able to match that with some of the qual qualitative data um, to get the narrative on, you know, behind why they use the products that they choose to use. Next slide. And so small exposures, they add up. And so why is this uh, a concern? Because cumulative um, impacts or exposures um, can put you at you know, greater list, uh, risk. And so none of us live in a bubble. So we are exposed to you know, a variety of toxins and chemicals, as I mentioned at the forefront, environmental health or just is something that you can't avoid. You know, we don't live in you know, a bubble or a contained environment. And so from where you live, you know, your streets, your neighborhood, you know, um, a, a variety of different things. And so being mindful um, from the time we wake up in the morning to the time we go to bed, as I mentioned, about about the products that we use, uh, especially if you're a reproductive age, you know, family planning and planning to have a family, how that can have an impact on you and your family and your partners. Um, so place-based uh, um, environment. And so um, also noting that in terms of chronic diseases, particularly breast cancer, it's thought of as being genetic, but the research and science supports that it's more of an environmental, you know, risk that you have more so than anything than genetics. And so looking at your exposure um, throughout your environment that you live in. So pay, uh, place based exposure. And these cumulative impacts or effects um, of exposures are unsafe um, um, due to the chemicals and toxins that we can be exposed to. Um, but with frequent repeated use, it is of real concerns um, that we have. So either because of the chemicals or carcinogens or because they disrupt the body's hormone. And so um, any low dose uh, or, you know, our amount that you use can be of concern. So um, we want to look at those products that we use. And sometimes lower dose may have more harmful than higher doses. Um, if you turn, you think about a thing that was in on um, one of the other discussions of Crown Act and talking about, you know, some of the products that you use and may, may contain, you know, mercury in there, which is, you know, oftentimes used in skin lightener treatments. And so you may use this thing, oh, well, I don't use, you know, a lot of it, but, you know, even there's no, you know, um, um, what should I say, um, baseline or low data, you know, or low amount that you can use that can still have, you know, impacts on that. So even, you know, the minor things that you can use throughout your day or in your products can have, you know, large you know, long-term effects. And so timing matters. So the period is in our lives. And so I subscribe this window of time, especially, you know, for those that are in their reproductive um, stage of their life, 
um, can have impacts on their, you know, fertility uh, and their impacts, their ability to, you know, conceive and to be able to, you know, have a um, um, family planning. So we want to look at that. So, you know, timing of exposures. And so, as we mentioned, you know, at Black Women for Wellness, we were looking at, you know, young girls as well. So being able to bring education and awareness, you know, from um, when they're young, you know, in terms of exposures. And so, here, you know, um, products that we can use and such as relaxers sometimes um, when um, children are introduced at a very young age to these types of products and so they can have cumulative impacts and so here I'm um, just rounding up the cumulative exposures and the low dose exposures they do matter and next slide. And I believe this is the last of my portion here before Janet um, goes over. So the aggregate exposures here, um, just wanted to note that um, exposures to uh, one single chemical via multiple exposure routes, such as thermal, oral, or inhalation from different um, sources, for example, several different, uh, several different um, consumer products. And so as we looked at here, nail polish, shampoos, lotions, um, vinyl floors, where you live, you you know, the um, off-gassing, you know, those plastics, when you get them out of the packaging, sometimes there's those fumes. That is toxic, you know, those fumes. Cleaning products also, um, that's why it's so important to have proper ventilation. Um, intravenous tubing, medical um, bagging, you know, phthalates and food packaging, like the wrappers that they use in some of the food products that we eat. All of these are, you know, aggregate exposures throughout our day. And so we want to be mindful of that in terms of you know um, what we are exposed to and how they can have potential risks um, bringing out to phthalates and endocrine disruptor compounds and how they can um, be linked to breast cancer developmental issues decreased fertility obesity and asthma all of these are you know of great concern although some phthalates are banned from kids toys uh, you know like pajamas and things of that nature when we're talking about flame retardants you know there's wide regulation around that that is not across the board you know for everything so um, phthalates oftentimes can be you know in shampoos and conditioners and so uh, we want to bring education and awareness to that if you go to our website we do have what we call a chem card which is something that you can use to see some of the products that you should avoid using it's a handy little card that you can um, digitally download and take it with you when you go to the when you're out and about going to the beauty supply store or you're going to get your you know any <clears throat> products and just so you know, you can, you know, um, be mindful about the products um, going in, getting your nails. So go into, you know, those are taking your own nail, you know, um, nail, um, nail care, you know, products with you to the salons um, and also looking for, you know, things in terms of your fragrance um, and other beauty aids, hair care products to be able to be, you know, um, more consumer conscious. And so next slide. Okay, well, thank you, Astrid, so much. That was a really terrific overview. And I wanna thank all of you for attending our workshop today about how to get active on this issue. My name is Janet Noodleman. I come wearing two hats today. I'm the Director of Program and Policy at Breast Cancer Prevention Partners. We're the only national organization focused solely on preventing breast cancer by identifying and eliminating the environmental links to the disease. So we're all about toxic chemicals, chemicals in the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, the consumer products we use, the places we work and the communities we live and getting those chemicals better regulated so as to decrease our, our collective risk of breast cancer. Since 2004, I've also served as the director of BCPP's Campaign for Safe Cosmetics, we're a market-based campaign focused on raising consumer awareness about the problem of toxic chemicals in beauty and personal care products, getting cosmetic companies to do better voluntarily, uh, but our end game has always been to secure stricter and more health protective regulation of the chemicals and cosmetics by the Food and Drug Administration so that we're all protected. Next slide, please. So I thought it would be fun for us to do a little product use survey. Um, when I do these talks, what I find is that everyone underestimates the number of beauty and personal care products they use every day. 
So I want to invite you to take out your cell phones and scan the little QR code in the right there. And, um, and what's going to pop up is a poll for you that will ask you to estimate the number of products that you use every day. One to five, six to 10, 11 to 15, 16 to 20, 21 to 25, 26 to 30, um, et cetera. Okay. And I know this, this top end seems really crazy to you, 66 or more, but um, I want you to invite you to just guess. All you're doing right now is guessing how many products you think you might use. And um, this is, I think, you know what I'm going to do is I'm just going to share my screen. Um, that's okay. And, um, and this is what the poll looks like that you're taking. All right. So if everyone could go ahead and do that. The next thing I'm going to do is share the screen to see if, um, I wonder if I'm able to do this, to see if we've got some live results here. Oh, we do. Okay, let me go back, see if I might be able to show you. This is what we've got in terms of results. So, all right, 40% of you think you only use between six to 10 products. Uh, They're with I, me. <laughs> I beg to differ. Um, take a look at those numbers. So about 60% of you are, are thinking you use somewhere between six to 15 products. Um, and a handful of you think more. So this is very interesting because what I wanna suggest to you is when we say cosmetics, of course you think we mean just makeup. And if you're like me, you don't use very much makeup. Um, can you go ahead and share this? Go back, Sophia, to the PowerPoint. So here's a list of 70. I just did this off the top of my head. 70 beauty and personal care products because the FDA legal definition of cosmetic products includes personal hygiene. So toothpaste and mouthwash, deodorant, shampoo, conditioner, um, body wash, face cleanser, body lotion. Like most of us use those kinds of products, right? So now I want to invite you to take the next poll. So go ahead and pull up the QR code on your uh, mobile device and you're gonna get a, this is the really fun part, okay? You're gonna get a poll that looks like this. I wonder if I just shared my screen correctly. Um, yes, so you're gonna get a poll that looks like this and you're actually going to be able to tick off every product that you use. So go ahead and do that because this is a really, this is the fun part of the, um, of the survey that we're taking. Just really quickly go through the list and tick off as many of these products that you use um, in a day. You're just talking about a day and you're gonna see, this is the 71 products that I just mentioned. And as you're doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and see how many of you are participating and we'll see what the real numbers are. Okay, I think I have to go here first. All right, um, so if you take a look at this, you're seeing, yeah, 100% of you use conditioner, toothpaste, deodorant, cuticle cream. So this, this is a little harder, right? Because 71 products, you're not going to be able to get through this list pretty that quickly. But if, you know, even down toward the bottom, we're looking at like bath oil, blush, body oil, sunscreen, et cetera. The point here, and you can go back, Sophia, to the PowerPoint if you don't mind. The point that we're trying to make here is that you would be really surprised at how many beauty and personal care products you use. And the point is they add up. 
back in the day, the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics did a product use survey of Americans. And this was about 10 years, 15 years ago. And what we came up with was a super conservative number. And that is that Americans use somewhere about an average of 12, a dozen personal care products every day. And just by using 12 alone, um, you are exposed to 126 unique, unique chemicals, many of which are linked to adverse health effects. And this is a real problem because you might be surprised to know that the cosmetics industry uses 10,000 chemicals, industrial chemicals, to manufacture the beauty and personal care products we use every day. These are chemicals that are used to stabilize plastics and grease gears and make pesticides. Like these are super crazy, harsh, abrasive industrial chemicals used in our, in our bubble bath and baby shampoo and, 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 uh, and conditioner and body wash. Um, and, the U.S. law that exists currently today to regulate those 10,000 chemicals was enacted over 80 years ago, and it has only been updated twice since then. The U.S. federal law is that exists is two pages. We have two pages of federal law to regulate a $100 billion domestic cosmetics industry and a $220 billion um, um, global cosmetics industry. The industry itself um, uses, like I said, 10,000 chemicals to formulate cosmetics and 7,000 chemicals to formulate um, uh, fragrance and 3,000 chemicals, oh, I'm sorry, 4,000 chemicals to formulate the fragrance that makes our product smell good and 3,000 chemicals to formulate the flavors that make our chapsticks and our mouthwash and our toothpaste taste good. So I wanna just give you a sense of, out of those 10,000 chemicals, how many are banned by the Food and Drug Administration? And the number is 11. Now this is compared to over 2,400 chemicals that are banned by the European Union from the beauty and personal care products we use every day. So for example, in the United States, companies can legally use and do legally use chemicals linked to cancer, birth defects, reproductive harm, neurotoxicity, asthma and other respiratory uh, conditions. For example, in the, in the European Union, lead is banned from lipstick, but it is currently used in the United States, as well as in hair dyes. Um, you can find coal tar, which is another human carcinogen present in hair dyes and dandruff shampoos. Um, and these are just a few examples, just a handful of chemicals that are banned in their, the European Union from cosmetics sold there, but present in cosmetics um, here in the United States. The lack of FDA statutory authority over cosmetic safety creates a real buyer beware situation for consumers and for professional salon workers. The two and a half pages of existing law that I mentioned um, do not require cosmetic manufacturers to conduct any pre-market safety testing of the chemicals in their products for safety. Uh, which means a cosmetic manufacturer can use virtually any raw material as a cosmetic ingredient without any FDA pre-market safety testing or review. And what that also means is that the FDA can't issue mandatory recalls of cosmetic products, even if they're harming human health. And we saw this when the newspaper started screaming about the presence of asbestos in kids' cosmetics sold by Claire. And the FDA could not insist that Claire's, Claire conduct a mandatory recall of those products. We've also seen the problem of asbestos in talcum powder sold by Johnson & Johnson, formaldehyde and hair straightening products, and the list just goes on and on. The other problem 
is that what little federal regulation that exists does require companies to list the ingredients on the labels of beauty and personal care products, but there's a gaping loophole that causes a problem for all of us, but particularly for women of color. And that's called the fragrance and flavor loophole. So again, all of the ingredients have to show up on a product label with the exception of fragrance and flavor. And the majority of our personal care products smell good because they contain these fragrance chemicals, these secret fragrance chemicals. So in 2019, Breast Cancer Prevention Partners um, decided to, to investigate this problem. And we tested 40 beauty and personal care and cleaning products in order to, to look for secret fragrance chemicals that were hiding in those products. And what we found was really disturbing. The 10 most toxic products you can see right here um, included a list of celebrity endorsed uh, perfumes and fragrances, a few shampoos, uh, two cleaning products. Um, next slide, please. And the most toxic product out of those 40 products that we tested was a kid shampoo marketed to kids of color in a hair relaxing kit called Just For Me. And this is a product made by Strength of Nature. This product contained 24 chemicals of concern linked to adverse health effects, cancer, neurotoxicity, asthma, et cetera. But shockingly, 17 of those 24 chemicals didn't even appear on the product label. They were hiding under the word fragrance on the product label. So this product, uh, the Just For Me shampoo, was more toxic than the two cleaning products that we tested, which included an industrial disinfectant and a tub and tile cleaner. All right, so um, my very last slide talks about a, a package of safe cosmetics bills that we've introduced at the federal level. Um, a big part of the campaign for safe cosmetics, a major focus over the last decade and a half, has been trying to get cosmetic companies to do better voluntarily. And we've been really successful in that regard. We, we've managed to um, convince the nation's biggest nail product companies to stop using the toxic trio. We've driven triclosan and some of the worst phthalates and parabens out of cosmetics. But our end game has always been the enactment of federal cosmetic safety reform so that everyone will be protected regardless of where they live, where they work, or where they shop. And to that end, I'm really proud to say the first week of October, we introduced a suite of four cosmetic safety bills at the federal level that we're referring to as the Safer Beauty Bill Package. And these are bills that we worked on with We Act for Environmental Justice, the host of today's conference, Women's Voices for the Earth, the California Healthy Nail Salon Collaborative, and a couple of key uh, sustainable business organizations. And the, what the four bills do, um, um, we think are really exciting. The first bill, the Toxic Free Beauty Act, would ban... So I was saying the, the first bill, the Toxic Free Beauty Act, is a bill that would ban a dozen chemicals, the worst of the worst chemicals on the planet, from beauty and personal care products sold in the United States, as well as the entire class of perfluorinated forever chemicals. And the, the chemicals that would be banned by this bill include mercury, which is found in skin lighteners. Uh, four types of formaldehyde found in um, uh, hair straightening products and a lot of other uh, products. Two phenylenediamines, which are hair dye chemicals. This is really important because we know that when Black women regularly dye their hair, they face a 60% increased risk of breast cancer, 60% higher than white women who regularly dye their hair two uh, long chain parabens, which are uh, commonly used as preservatives and been, have been found in breast tumors, uh, and two phthalates. The next bill, the Fragrance and Flavor Ingredient Right to Know Act, 
would require the disclosure of fragrance chemicals that are toxic to human health and the environment. Again, a real issue for women of color because um, lots of women of color uh, like fragranced products. And, um, and we know that many fragrance chemicals are hormone disrupting chemicals as well as linked to other adverse health effects. The third bill, the Cosmetic Safety Protections for Women of Color and Salon Workers is a really great bill. What it does is it would create three different um, uh, grants programs administered by the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences and the EPA, as well, um, oh, well, I just said NIHS and EPA, that would fund research into chemicals of concern in products marketed to women of color and salon workers, as well as green chemistry alternatives. And the bill would also require the disclosure of the ingredients in professional salon products, because currently those ingredients by law don't have to be disclosed. And then lastly, there's a supply chain transparency bill that would require the upstream suppliers of ingredients, raw materials, finished cosmetic products, and fragrance and flavor formulations to fully disclose the ingredients in those materials, as well as safety and toxicity data to the downstream users, so to the companies themselves, so that they can make safer products. So that is my last slide. Oh, we've got two more slides. Um, Astrid, did you want to really quickly talk about the J&J &J yes, campaign? Yes, I can. So just quickly on the next slide is our global campaign um, that we have uh, with a coalition of partners. And so as Janet mentioned, Johnson & Johnson has had a history of uh, predatory, you know, marketing campaigns, you know, for communities of color. If you can imagine, you know, the baby powder um, that we can use for personal hygiene as well as on our babies and infants. And so we want to bring a notice to this. And so we started our campaign in July, or excuse me, June of 2020, and generated support of more than 200 organizations representing 50 countries from around the globe. And so it is a huge, you know, um, campaign that we want to make great impact. And so this campaign is calling on Johnson & Johnson to stop their global sales. Um, they did say in response to uh, one of the letters that we wrote um, by our executive director, Jan Robinson Flint from Black Women of Wellness, um, that they would stop domestically here in the Northern um, America and Canada to sell, but you can still buy the products online on Amazon or either um, you know, discounted stores, uh, which uh, we act actually has brought notice to some of the Bottega stores in Harlem um, have had the baby products in there. So long story short is, is that this is, we say it's not good enough. So we want to make sure that the products are, you know, no longer available. They're justly disposed of and also not available, you know, from around the world. And so that is what our campaign is. And actually, if you go to our uh, website, www.la.org, we do have a, a robust uh, campaign that historically, you know, has our information in there about press release and what we're doing to address, excuse me, this issue. So what can you do personally? Um, obviously, you can, you know, be more of an advocate for yourself, looking at the products you use, reading labels. I mentioned again on that website we have, we have our Kim cards um, that you can look at the ingredients to exclude. Um, Janet did a very thorough job in talking about some of those um, ingredients of interest like phthalates, uh, endocrine disruptors, parabens, all of that. So basically, um, detox, uh, detoxifying your um, skincare, beauty, and the products that you use. So rating your, you know, medicine cabinets. Um, a good app to use, there are quite a few, or a few of them, Claria, which is one, it's like an extension that you can use. So when you're shopping online, it can reference, you know, the products um, or the ingredients in the products that you're purchasing. Think 30, and then the EWG, which is the Environmental Working Group, has the Healthy Living app um, that can help you choose, you know, safer products that gives it on a rating from one to 10. Um, so the rating from the worst to the, you know, the best. And so um, you can use that as well as visiting safecosmetics.org to learn more about 